For our first keynote, uh, the people walking in have missed that or are thinking they're in the wrong place, probably. Uh, we have um, Nigel Alvarez, who is Vice President of Global Marketing Business Planning at Marvell Technology. Uh, he's responsible for leading Marvell's corporate marketing, portfolio marketing, industry analyst relations, market research, and market, uh, end market strategic planning, demand planning, pricing for the company. Busy guy. Um, he's been uh, with us uh, uh, several years at Flash Memory Summit. Uh, he joined Marvell in 2017 as VP of Marketing for its Flash Business Unit. Uh, where he led its general management covering product management, product marketing, business strategy, uh, um, product roadmaps, customer relations, and had, has P&L responsibility. Be, uh, before joining Marvell, uh, Nigel worked for uh, Infi, high-speed interconnect innovator, uh, on their emerging NVDIMs. And prior to that, uh, Nigel was a founding member of PMC Sierra's enterprise storage division. He possesses 20 years data infrastructure, semiconductor product management, and marketing experience, spanning data networking, storage, memory, and server compute. He earned his bachelor in electrical engineering degree from McGill University in Montreal and an MBA from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. His topic today is transforming cloud infrastructure for the AI era. Please welcome Nigel Alvarez. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. All right, super excited. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back at FMS. Um, I had a four-year hiatus from, uh, from here, um, and a lot has changed in those four years. Think about it. Um, four years ago, I don't think when I used to go to the car dealership, they would know what a semiconductor is. So today, they know what semiconductors are, right, after the COVID shortage. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how we can advance the world forward now for the next four years. So let's get started. So quick disclaimer to protect me from getting a yellow jumpsuit. Um, all the forward-looking statements um, will um, be shared here. Um, please read this disclaimer. So let's get started. I'd like to start by asking you to think about the powerful impact that technologies had over the last 40 years. With a touch of a button or a click, we're now able to instantly connect with friends and family across the global world. Healthcare advances like human genome uh, mapping have drastically improved our ability to diagnose disease in a quick manner, in record-setting times. It's transforming the industry. Let's talk about the automotive industry. In 2021, the CEO of Volvo stated his company's goal was for no one to be killed by or seriously injured in a new Volvo car by 2025. This is part of Volvo's broader vision and strategy. Think about that for a minute. The number of people that yearly, get, that yearly pass away from automobile accidents is over a million folks. It's really sad, and now for the first time, we're thinking about and talking about eliminating these debts through advanced technology. Now let me ask you this, when you consider the technology that enables all of this, what do you think of? Typically you think of your cell phone, your smartphone, your PC, maybe your car, but the reality is those are just endpoints. And the real power displaying all of those outcomes is the massive technology behind it, the infrastructure behind it that enables it all. Specifically, the PCs and other devices, they interact frequently, but they're interacting with the cloud. And the interconnectedness of all those massive supercomputers in the cloud are enabling us to get these outcomes and these results from technology. And the fact that your car doesn't crash is not because of its sensors, it's because of the massive supercomputers that have trained over thousands and thousands and even millions of car data. And that data is being trained and enabling our cars to go forward without accidents, right? And it's continued to advance. Even when we go to Google, 
The instant search results we get are made possible by the massive data centers that sit in the cloud. So the true power of technology really lies in its ability to connect and process these vast amounts of data, and that's where the cloud infrastructure comes. And the scale of the cloud infrastructure is truly remarkable. To put it in perspective, there's approximately 1,000 hyperscaler data centers worldwide. And, these, and they're building about 100 per year. So significant growth going on there. Each of these cloud data centers has tens to hundreds of thousands of servers. The average size of these data centers are significantly millions and millions of square feet and consume significant amounts of power. Without this cloud infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to enjoy all the benefits of the technology we see today. In the past, solving complex problems could be done on a single workstation at your desk. But the problems we are solving today require and utilize massive sets of data. And the only way to solve this is using the cloud infrastructure that has unlimited amounts of compute, storage, memory, and networking resources that can be scaled up and down. And this is why the majority of the world's data has converged to the cloud. The cloud is able to aggregate it, analyze it, and turn it into meaningful outcomes. One of the applications that's driving strong, strong data center cloud growth today in this very tough macro environment is AI. Over the past year, AI, specifically generative AI, or gen AI, such as ChatGPT, has taken the world by storm. And it's taken the cloud by storm. Not too long ago, we were spending decades of research trying to figure out how to get a computer to beat a human being in chess. In recent years, we've witnessed significant breakthroughs in AI. Why is that? The answer lies in cloud infrastructure that is enabling AI. In the past, we had limited computing, memory, networking, storage resources. But now, with the cloud, we're able to put that all together and have meaningful resources to advance AI. And we've actually reached a tipping point. And the pace of progress is super fast, unseen, really. If you look at ChatGPT, it took it five days to reach one million active users. And it didn't stop there. Now it's over 100 million users. They actually surpassed 100 million users in five months. Put this in perspective and comparison. Facebook took 10 months to get to one million active users. And then the good Netflix DVD service took three and a half years. Now what makes this rapid adoption curve so impressive is this relies, ChatGPT and, and AI relies on cloud infrastructure. And typically, historically, nothing on the infrastructure side moves quickly, right? It takes a lot of planning, a lot of industry standard work, um, standardization, all those kind of things takes a lot of time. But this moves super fast. Why was scaling uh, uh, ChatGPT so quick? It was, again, the cloud infrastructure. It would have been impossible without cloud infrastructure. Now think about these other applications I talked about. What infrastructure did it take for Netflix to get to one? It was the postal office or the postal service. The US Postal Service took, was the infrastructure. How about Facebook? Well, Facebook did use data centers, but it was really running a web farm, right, uh, with text and images. These generative AI applications are having profound impact and large companies across the globe are investing billions of dollars to support the infrastructure, to support it. Now, going forward to advance AI, you need to really have large, diverse data sets. It's crucial for driving the advancement. For instance, to train an AI system to identify dogs from photos, you needed about a millions or you know, a few millions of dog images or images, right, to really. But if you wanted to look at the chat GPT data set, the latest one for the subscription, which is based on uh, GPT-4, that model was trained on an estimated 
greater than one trillion parameters. So to continue this growth curve and push the boundaries of AI, greater data sets are needed and diversity of these data sets. Unfortunately, standard general purpose CPUs and GPUs used in current architectures cannot really support this 10x uh, annual growth rate. This chart specifically illustrates how those models and parameters have been growing, highlighting the 10x growth per year. And going forward, because Moore's law is not going 10x every year, you need to change something. And what is that change? Infrastructure must transform. A ho more holistic approach and architecture is needed. And this involves software, systems, silicon, um, and that silicon spans compute, storage, memory, networking. Um, and it's gonna require a mix of different pieces, some pieces that have not even been invented yet. But it will involve your GPUs, your TPUs, your CPUs, your storage devices, your memory devices, but those devices and products will need to be evolving. And one first step that's been taken right now is instead of using your double socket or dual socket CPU uh, servers as your building block, you've now moved to an AI server. And an AI server is actually a cluster of GPUs. And that is actually the first step of moving to an AI infrastructure. You can start with as few as eight to 10 GPUs, AI accelerators in a cluster, and then continue building it up, right? Hundreds of, of GPUs in the cluster and TPUs to thousands to tens of thousands. And if you think about it, the chat GPT or GPT-3 was built on approximately 10,000 GPUs that were all clustered together. And going forward, to continue this level of scale, you're gonna have data centers all clustered of, with these AI accelerators, TPUs, and GPUs with other technologies behind it. And it's not gonna be limited to a single data center is the honest truth. We're already seeing with some of our customers using multiple data centers to build these clusters to address the growing workloads. Now, if you look at that problem statement, it's not limited to the compute elements. There's a lot of connectivity that has to happen between all these clusters. And that's super critical, and it's gonna need low latency, high bandwidth connectivity. And we're talking like terabits per second. And this is gonna be a very significant challenge for our industry that I'll talk more about, but it's a super exciting opportunity for all of us in this room to develop the next generation architecture. Now, I wanna take a step back a little bit if you look at all the big cloud hyperscalers in the world, each of these companies is relatively unique when it comes to architecture. Some companies are doing search as their number one business, or they're doing social media, or they're doing infrastructure as a service. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the way you look at this, you can't have a single type of solution that fits it all. One size does not fit all when it comes to addressing these different environments. Same problem's gonna occur for AI. If I'm building an AI solution that's good for search, I gotta make sure it works with my search infrastructure, similarly for social media. So this is driving a big paradigm shift to something what we call at Marvell cloud optimized silicon, where the cloud operators build tailor customized architectures because of their scale and, if, and the requirements for efficiency. And we've been working with these companies for the last uh, five years on developing these types of architectures. And it's, um, early in, it's in the early innings. And I'll share more about the journey to cloud optimized silicon. So let's rewind the clock a little bit. 15 years ago, if you think about it, the cloud was running on standard, industry standard servers, really mainly dual socket x86. They took more or less the existing infrastructure that was on-prem and they put it in the cloud. Software was supposed to do everything, right? They said software eats the world. Unfortunately, that did not happen, or fortunately for all of us, it's not happening, and it's become a very inefficient solution. So then the advent of heterogeneous computing emerged, 
And that's where you started to see accelerated computing with offloads as GPUs, TPUs, DPUs, FPGAs. Those started to emerge to offload some of those capabilities from the host CPU to make it more efficient. Still, those solutions had challenges because they were not optimized for the given workload or service that that cloud operator wanted to deliver. And that, over the last five years, has spurred the move to cloud-optimized silicon. And you can see here, now you have companies doing custom TPUs, custom GPUs, custom CPUs. And this requires the convergence of compute, memory, storage, electro-optics, and networking. Because you're looking at the problem statement in a holistic manner. You're no longer looking at it at the compute level. To really get optimizations or efficiencies out, you need to look at it at the system level. And because these cloud companies have so much scale and resources, and when I say resources, engineers, they're able to invest in this capability of developing optimal architectures that are customized for their environments. So what is, exactly is cloud-optimized silicon? So on the right, of the, on, on the right or left on this chart, you can see today a general purpose CPU has got a lot of different blocks. It's got like PCIe, PCIe controllers, PCIe lanes, it's got an uh, X amount of CPU cores, it might have some NVMe accelerators, it might have a security block. It's got a ton of blocks in there, but they're trying to put the superset of all their customers in a single general purpose device that they can sell to all the different markets. So unfortunately, it's not optimized for anything. It's trying to be everything to everyone, which doesn't work in this direction of where the cloud market's going. And there's an there's an no, enormous benefit of moving to a customized or cloud-optimized solution. And here you can see there's, I'm showing two examples, Cloud A and Cloud B, because Cloud A maybe is focused on video upload. So they're going to build a CPU and accelerator that is optimized with their engine. So it might take engines from their IP with IP from a silicon provider like Marvell to build an optimized solution for video uploading. Maybe the other person is looking to do an optimized search CPU where they need a lot of DRAM and they want a lot of DRAM uh, channels and, and memory controllers, right? Now, it doesn't stop at the silicon level. It's actually also at the firmware, software, form factor, uh, levels, right? So there's multiple levels you can do these customizations and optimizations. You know, when I was running the, the flash business at, you, unit at Marvell, we started do-it-yourself SSDs for this market. That's a form of cloud-optimized silicon solutions, where our cloud companies would take our controller, we would develop firmware with them, and develop a form factor and work with the NAND makers to develop an optimized solution for their infrastructure. And that might be different SSDs in different environments in their whole architecture. This is where the puck's going and has been going for the last couple of years. Now, don't take my word for it. You can read it in the press on a regular basis. All the large hyperscaler cloud data center companies are developing their own customized solutions to tackle their unique services and workload requirements. And this is actually accelerating with the advent of AI. Now, why is it accelerating with the advent of AI? It's because there's significant challenge is AI infrastructure has. Today's AI infrastructure has significant bottlenecks. And when I say bottlenecks, they're connectivity bottlenecks. It starts with the CPU to memory. That's one bottleneck. You have GPU to memory, GPU to GPU. You have GPU to storage element. Those are all bottlenecks right now in the environment. And when you solve one bottleneck, the other one pops up. So it's like this, it's a whack-a-mole type of thing happening right now where we really had to take a step back at the system level and figure out how you develop a system level optimized solution. Similarly, we are seeing bottlenecks for capacity. You need more memory capacity to really 
serve all those models that are growing, right, to really get efficiencies. Similarly, latency is critical. Do I want to wait three minutes to see the text coming back from my, my inquiry? No, right? So inference is also going through a huge change of how you do that more optimally as your data sets get larger and larger. Now, you're, see, you're not seeing this impact. You know, you're, you go type in chat GPT, you get a result pretty nicely. But in the back door, or you know, when you go under the hood, the cloud data center companies are only seeing 30 to 50% utilization of that expensive GPU or TPU or AI accelerators. Think about that for a minute. Guess how much a, TP, uh, a GPU costs? A GPU is probably $10,000 plus, maybe $30,000 today. And if you're only getting 30% of that, that is like huge wastage. Now that's only wastage at the CapEx level. So huge CapEx impact, right? Excess CapEx spend, excess power. These things are power hungry. And it's not only the, the GPU or the AI accelerator, it's all the connectivity that's going on. So excess power, and as you guys all know, power is so costly in this day and age, especially in California. And I can't stress, they, cloud operators have a certain power budget for their data center, how much power they can actually service in that rack. Just to put this in perspective for all of you in the room, a typical cloud server power envelopes about 1K watt, right? So one kilowatt, 1,000 watts. Today's typical AI server is 10,000 watts, 10x. So think about it, if your rack is only provisioned to do 20,000 kilowatts or 20 kilowatts, you can only fit maybe two AI servers, but that takes away 20 compute servers that you could put in there. So this is the kind of equation that the cloud data centers are trying to solve right now is like, I only have this much budget in my data center. How do I juggle between compute servers and my AI servers, especially when the puck's going to all AI right now, right? So significant problem and challenge that's gonna require cloud-optimized architectures and solutions at the AI level. It's critical going forward. Now, just give you an example. If you look at AI network bandwidth challenge, today's server platform, you know, a typical cloud server is about 100, um, 100 uh, gigabits per second NIC card coming out. So the networking coming out of a server, 100 gig going to the top of the rack of switch. Today, if you look at an AI cluster to get all of the power of those GPUs out, you would need 30 terabits per second to come out of that. So a 300x amount of networking needs to come out if you wanted to get optimal connectivity between all these GPUs or TPUs, right? Because you want to maximize the efficiency. I just showed you the average is 30 to 50% uh, depending on your stack and your environments and everything like that. So you're going to need significant networking to solve this challenge. So what does that mean? That means you're going to have to move to optics will be everywhere. So I can't stress this. As you move to terabits per second, you can do it electrically. You could maybe do this much trace length on your board maybe, but you can't go, you know, 100 meters uh, and beyond, right? You need optics. And this optics is not going to be only limited to your networking. It's going to actually move to your memory subsystem. It's going to move to your storage subsystem over time as you look to get optimal sharing and, optim and utilization of all these resources. So the requirement for high bandwidth, low latency um, connectivity is going, to be is going to drive the need for optics everywhere. And again, I want to stress because everyone in this room is tied to more memory and storage is memory and storage are going to need optics. And what I mean by that specifically is if you look at the two big memory and storage pools, memory is starting to move to this technology called CXL, or we're in the early innings of CXL. Now CXL, at the end of the day, is going after multiple applications. But if we just zone in on AI for today, you're going to need to do certain customizations and acceleration in CXL, depending again back to your 
cloud operator of what technology you want there. Do you want 20 ports of CXL? Do you want XYZ uh, cores of ARM and RISC V in there and these IP blocks to accelerate? That is going to drive connectivity for that use case. So that's memory is going to move to C is moving to CXL type of uh, architectures, and optics is going to really be the key enabler of taking it to the level to get these optimizations. NAND storage right now is more tied to the number of channels and bandwidth you can get out. So we're still limited by the NAND technology, where you have to go put more NAND channels to get that throughput and bandwidth. But there's going to be new architectures here where you use accelerators in front of your NAND, um, let's call it NAND um, units, instead of calling it SSD, just say a pool of NAND, but let's call it units of NAND um, that you're, you're going to be. Your accelerator will actually aggregate all that stuff and do certain things to make it better for AI. These are just a couple of examples of cloud innovations that are going to need to happen to feed the AI engines. Because the AI engines are growing like this, and you don't want to keep them idle, like I just said. If they're idle, the cloud uh, operator is significantly losing uh, OPEX or profitability. Now at Marvell, we have a very comprehensive portfolio for the AI era. And we've been very deliberate and strategic in how we invested organically and how we acquired. And we have these three pillars. We have one pillar called Accelerated Compute, which has started really with our Oction DPU product line, and now it's evolved to doing custom ARM servers, custom DPUs, uh, smart NICs, and CXL plays into that as well. So CXL um, custom solutions and cloud optimized solutions will fall in both the accelerated compute arena as well as in our memory and storage arena. And what I wanted to highlight here is this wide portfolio are the building blocks. We have standard products, but as I mentioned, the cloud operators want customized, optimized solutions. So we take these building blocks across the three pillars and we start to develop optimal solutions with those cloud operators. And that's really where the market's going for this AI era. Now, behind the scenes, you have these product or technologies, but you need a platform. You need bleeding edge technology at the three nanometer, five nanometer CMOS process nodes. And then you need sophisticated packaging, because now you're putting optics in there with silicon, 3D packaging, stacking memories in there, very complex things. And it's early innings again for this chiplet architectures, but it is coming together to develop this optimized solution. And one critical thing I want to uh, share here is you need flexible business models. So we got to work together and collaborate. Memory, storage, silicon, um, silicon controller technologies to really put these solutions together. So it's not going to be one company that solves this. It can't really be solved, this challenge by a single company. It, it really needs the whole industry to come together and collaborate. And there's hundreds of pieces in here, right? I just touched upon a few. And everyone who's building DPUs, GPUs, CPUs, memory, storage, need to come together and work with these system companies, cloud companies, and software companies to come, to, to come up with these solutions. And again, it's not one size fits all, so we'll have to adjust business models to make sure we address the opportunity at hand. So just to, to close out, We've been going through this journey of eras over the last 40 years, right? It started with the desktop and mainframe, and it's continued with the internet, and we keep building on top of these eras, right? Where we get more and more productive, the world becomes much easier to operate. You know, I wish I was my kids yeah, when I was growing up, right? They got these phones that can do all the power that it took me 20 years uh, to get in their hands, right? And the AI era is building on the cloud era that I just talked about, right? A ton of data out there, a ton of infrastructure. But now we got to take that infrastructure and transform it for the AI era. So three key points I want you to take away. Take, take away number one, 
AI is taking the world and the cloud by storm, right? And you guys all see this and know this. I think there's multiple keynotes all talking about the AI era. Two, every cloud AI is unique. So that's another big one that I just think you all need to digest because it's not one size fits all. The old world was like, hey, I build this controller, I can sell it to everyone. That's not the way it works today. And then last but not least, cloud optimized silicon is going to power the AI era. So thank you for your time.